Welcome to Electro Online. Here we're going to review energy. And energy is also associated with work and power. Now this is a fairly big topic in physics and so it's going to take several videos to summarize everything you should know. Well, not everything of course, but the, the vast majority of what you should know in order to really understand energy, work and power and apply that to a whole variety of different kinds of problems. So here on this video we're going to look at the basics, the basic concepts of energy, work and power. So first of all, there are two types of mechanical energy. There's other types of energy, but when we think about mechanical energy, there are two types, and they're called potential energy and kinetic energy. And I like to write it as PE and KE to make it at least a little bit easier. Now, potential energy is what we call stored energy. Nothing is moving, it's sitting there ready to be utilized, so therefore we call it stored energy. Kinetic energy is energy due to motion. Anytime an object is in motion, regardless of what the motion is, regardless of what direction, it has kinetic energy. It could be flying like a projectile, it could be vibrating back and forth, it makes no difference. When the object is moving, it has kinetic energy. So some simple examples of potential energy would be an object being placed at a height above the ground level. So we define the ground level, whatever we want it to be. It could be the tabletop could be the ground level, but typically it's the ground. And any height above the ground we call height. And therefore we can say that the potential energy of an object, which is a certain height above the ground, is equal to mg times h. Now mg would be the weight of the object, h is the height. So the weight of the object times the height is what we call the potential energy, that is stored energy. We can also store energy by compressing a spring or by elongating a spring away from its relaxed position. So here we apply a force, we compress a spring. A spring is known to have what we call a spring constant. By definition, the spring constant is equal to the ratio of the force applied on the spring and how far we compress it. That ratio is known as the spring constant. The stronger the spring, the more force you need to, comp to compress it, the bigger the spring constant. So when you compress a spring and hold it in place, you then have stored energy there. When you let go, the spring bounces back. The potential energy stored is one half times the spring constant times the distance you compressed it squared or elongated, either way. Kinetic energy is always going to be the same. It's a universal equation that applies everywhere in the universe under all circumstances. When an object that has mass is moving with velocity v, it has kinetic energy equal to one half the mass times the velocity squared. What's interesting there is that when you have height here, when you double the height, you have double the potential energy. However, when you double the speed, you have four times the kinetic energy. So there's a little bit of difference there. There's also what we call rotational kinetic energy, which is usually covered in later chapters. But I just want to mention it, that the kinetic energy due to an object rotating is one half I omega squared. I is what we call the moment of inertia, and omega is called the angular speed or the radial speed. And that is typically expressed in terms of radians per second. The moment of inertia is different for different objects, but it always contains the term mr squared. And then in this case, since it's a solid disk, it would be one half mr squared. But again, we don't want to pay too much attention to it now. That will be covered in more detail later. I just want to mention it in case you say, well, isn't there rotational kinetic energy? And the answer is yes, there is. A good thing to memorize is that when you have an object at a certain height, and therefore at the top it has potential energy mgh, if you then let it go and it falls to the ground, right before it hits the ground, the velocity at the bottom will be equal to the square root of 2gh. The same thing would happen if you allow something to slide down from an incline, if it starts at an initial height equal to h, and it's, let's say there's no friction, so there's no energy loss due to friction, then you could say by the time it slides to the bottom, the, the speed at the bottom will be the square root of 2gh, so it doesn't matter if you drop an object or slide it down, provided there's no friction, the velocity after a height difference will always be the square root of 2gh. Of course, there's all kinds of other situations where it will not be equal to 2gh because of energy loss and other things. The concept of work. Work, by definition, is the dot product of the force times the displacement. So when you push on an object and the object is displaced, the work done will be the product of the two. But 
if the force is not applied in the same direction as the displacement, we have to multiply the force times the displacement times the angle, the cosine of the angle between them. So it becomes the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the displacement times the cosine of the angle between them. And that is defined as the work done. We can also say that the work done equals the change in energy of the object on which you do work. And so we'll see some examples of that as well. The units for work are Newton times meters. And a Newton times meter, because that's force times meter, which is displacement, gives you joules. And joules is a unit of work, which is also a unit of energy. MGH, notice that MG is a force, that's the weight. H is a displacement, force times displacement. Again, it's Newton times meters, gives you the unit of joules. Then finally, we want to go to the concept of power. Now, power is the rate of doing work. How fast can you do work? The more power you have, the faster you can do work. And so in this case, it's the amount of work you can do over a certain amount of time elapsed. For units, work is in joules, time is in seconds, joules per second becomes watts. So we have a new unit, the unit of watts, to describe the unit of power. We also have an old unit called a horsepower, and a horsepower equals 746 watts. One once upon a time, they measured how fast a horse could do work. They picked a horse, they rigged something up, and they determined that a horse can lift up 550 pounds in one second, uh, a distance of one foot, and that was then defined as a, as a horsepower. So we have a video on that if, you, if you're interested. But the most important thing on this entire board is probably this energy equation or maybe called the energy balance equation because we have a left side and a right side and an equal sign and so in all circumstances regardless of what happens to an object if it's pushed or pulled or thrown or shoved you name it or dropped we know that the sum of the work put into the system plus the initial potential energy that it had when we started plus the initial kinetic energy that it had when it started must equal the final potential energy, the final kinetic energy, and any energy you might have lost due to frictional wind resistance and so forth. So typically the energy lost is due to some frictional forces, some retarding forces slowing the object down, trying to make the object stop. So, work put into the system is that if there's any force acting on the system during the process you will add energy because work is a change in energy so when you do work on a system you will add energy on top of what you already started with this is the total energy you started with which is comprises of the two types of mechanical energy you can have potential energy you can have kinetic energy you can have one or the other or both or none you could start out with none no energy it just sits there on the floor not moving it has no energy. Now you do work on the object, you put energy into it, and in the end you'll end up with some final potential energy, some final kinetic energy, and maybe some of that work you put into it was lost to overcoming friction. So this equation is an extremely important one which will solve the vast majority of the physics problems in the chapters dealing with energy, power, and, and work. Now, we're going to show you a number of examples utilizing this equation. So don't panic, say, well, I don't quite understand the equation. You'll see plenty of examples of that. But this is, in totality, I think, what you should know and understand of the basic concepts of energy, work, and power. And now, in the next videos, we'll show you some summarize, some summaries of the types of problems you'll run into and how to deal with them. And most of it will fall on this equation right here.